Well, I was um, I had something in mind to do because I was afraid that there's going to be too many PhDs and too much intellectual talk. So I wanted to dumb things down a bit. Um, if you just move your cup for a second, I've got a um, a representative from the uh, the Commission for Countering Extremism here. Because um, you know we don't want to in the interest of balance and all that. Um, in this little uh, little uh, ideas bowl, uh, we've got a few uh, uh, numbers, and those numbers correspond to uh, actual questions and tweets and stuff I saw from pro prevent people. Um, so I'll give you, I'll give you the honours of uh, lifting up. Uh, so you want me to just pull out the poop? <laughs> uh, p yeah. Lift up the d the prevent. <laughs> yeah. It should I'm be one thing. Just, uh, uh, one thing attached to him. <laughs> this is a cool uh oh cool it's idea. each each yeah. clip each yeah. uh feces so. represents a terrible <laughs> idea i'm assuming <laughs> assalamu alaikum everyone welcome to today's uh islam Tunisi unscripted podcast i'm your host salman but uh thanks for joining us again just a reminder uh if you haven't already uh subscribe hit the subscribe and the bell notification below if you're watching this on youtube uh Prevent has been uh, in the news a lot uh, recently, in the last week or two, our good old friend, um, for a few reasons. You know, we had the, a CAGE report on the alternative pr to Prevent, and we also had a few kind of high-profile organizations that found themselves uh, on the Prevent kind of extremism list, uh, such as Greenpeace and the Extension Rebellion. So I'm really glad to have two um, experts on Prevent now, people who research in this uh, area and in uh, academic capacity. Uh, we have Dr. Tariq, Tariq Yunus, I think so. Um, you are, your research is in prevent uh, or anti-extremism and psychology, right? Um, my research was specifically in how counter-radicalization is understood and practiced in healthcare. Okay. So I'm, I was much more interested in sort of race and politics in healthcare. Yeah, excellent. And as you know, he's uh, a foreigner, so you get extra points. Uh, where are you from? I'm from uh, I'm from Canada. Where you're really from? Just kidding. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, to my left Dr. Rob Paul Walker, Dr. Rob Paul Walker. Sorry, keep uh, me right. messing up your name. And you're you are a teacher in your was kind of I, professional background. You were a teacher. Was a teacher. You became radicalized. And uh, yeah, I was radicalized okay. to prevent. <laughs> 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 what is your uh, research area? So, so I, um, uh, after being, uh, yeah, after being radicalized by Prevent, I started looking into it a bit more. And one of the things that I noticed was that across different gov government strategies over time, the meaning of extremism changed. Yeah. And it kind of started off as a, uh, the government started tar targeting violent extremism. And then it sort of progressed on to just extremism with the violence being implicit in that. And so my, my research looks at the development of language around extremism and so to, uses that to understand the emergence of extremism. So why, why is it that 10 years ago extremism wasn't a problem yeah. and why has it now become a problem? And I suggest that that's just in the nature of the way that language and policy has developed rather than based on anything out in reality. Excellent. So um, Rob also, for those who uh, might recognize him, he's a, um, a Clark Kent impersonist impersonist is that a thing <laughs> impersonator uh, and he's also the um, the editor of prevent digest correct yeah can yeah. you tell us a bit about that uh so yeah so alongside doing my i, I did my phd over the last few years and i, can, I think it's a frustration of all academics that people end up writing these lengthy articles that sit on a library shelf and mm -hmm. are read by two people and so i started the prevent digest which i is a it's a, a newsletter that goes out every month and a website which is simply a list of all news on prevent and yeah. it comes in it kind of comes in in waves that you'll get some weeks where i'll spend five minutes making a list of 10 stories kind of thing mm. otherwise other months like like this month you know i spent an hour on the train just doing the last two days because there's mm. so much <laughs> going on with prevent at the moment yeah um, so you guys are i think uh, in a good place to help us navigate some of the stories that broke this week I hope so. Um, who wants to go first? What what kind of caught your eye with regards to prevent? There's been a few things. So, you know, uh, the whole well, we told you so, white people. Yeah. Kind of, <laughs> uh, Extinction Rebellion and uh, Greenpeace being. Does that, is that real? Because a lot of people saw those headlines. What's the truth behind that? 
I think, well, I think the, uh, so I guess in summary, just for people, and, and no one's going to have missed this, but in summary, there have been uh, a few documents have been leaked to The Guardian and they've, they're, they're documents that were produced by counterterrorism police, yeah. uh, which list, um, well, this is where it gets, it gets messy. Counterterrorism police have produced a list of, 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 um, of organizations and of the, the insignia of organizations that they list as left-wing organizations or far-right organizations or environmental organizations or, or, or animal rights organizations. Mm. So if, if the counterterrorism police are producing training material for these are the kind of organizations that are going to come across, that implicit in that is that there's something threatening about those organizations or there's something wrong with being a member of, the, of those organizations or they are they represent a, some kind of extremism i mean that that just seems to me that self-evident that if you produce that document as counterterrorism police that's what mm. you're, you're saying but then there's been likewise I, if you're the yellow pages you're yeah. producing those documents <laughs> because you want to add their phone numbers yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and uh, but then there's been the, there was this extraordinary press release that came from the counterterrorism police saying saying they first said it was they first firstly they said it was a local mistake, and then um, but then there have been more national documents have been been produced to show that this wasn't a local mistake. So they distanced themselves from that, and then there's been this there was this strange press release which said that of course the we, these are just examples of of left wing organisations and environmental organisations mm. and and we don't have any problem with them at all. So, well, this doesn't work. Like if you if you are the counterterrorism police and you've listed these organisations as left wing organisations, then you're you're you are describing them as problematic. Mm. That's implicit in what you're doing. Um, but just to keep us safe now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 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 anyway. So the, the first one that came out was Extinction Rebellion was the mm. first story that came out that they were listed as extremist, and then it was Greenpeace. And I just I think it's worth dwelling on one one point. I think the f from from my perspective, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but the, the Extinction Rebellion, I think it was their UK Twitter mm. account, the first um, tweet that they put out, what well, it absolutely foregrounded the Muslim experience of Prevent. Mm -hmm. It said Muslims have been experiencing this discrimination through Prevent for years. Now we've been targeted, which is exactly the right way around that it should be, because that mm. word, you know, Prevent is born out of the war on terror, the war on terror on Muslims, this idea of a clash of civilizations. And so it's it's really important that that's remembered. And then, interestingly, there have been other when you get into this kind of technology commentators who have been talking about this. And there's been a lot in the past on the kind of privacy and so. Well, well, well no, but I was going to say that there's a lot lot on in about the tech tech world being kind of very like colorblind and oh. white dominated. And there have been tech commentators who. Have, there was one guy who did exactly the opposite. He said said that um, that my my problem with prevent has always been on the fact that it it silences dissent, not and specifically said not about the Muslim experience of prevent, mm. which is, <laughs> I, I, it, it's it, I mean, it mm. it's kind of it, it's it's absurd and offensive to to go out of your way to make mm. that point, but it's 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 weird that 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 was kind of presented as a presumed position of neutrality yeah. i think i think that like silencing muslims is the neutral position um which is i mean kind pragmatically of that's probably how someone do, you know who is impacted by prevent uh i suppose would think that they can get out of, get out of a uh, sticky situation just like unfortunately many muslim organizations or individuals they'll throw fellow muslims under the bus mm. and say, oh i'm not like those people yeah you know i'm, I'm one of the good guys one of yeah. the good ones. Yeah. Uh, what impact do you think this is having? Um, it, it, that that it has on you know public bodies like the NHS just to have extension rebellion or something listed on the um, by the counter terrorism police. Salam, guys. Sorry to butt in, eh? But if you're enjoying this podcast, please head over to islamtunnelc.com forward slash donate to help us make more. And if you're not enjoying it, head over anyway and help us make better ones. Uh, what impact do you think this is having um, it, it, that, that it has on you know public bodies like the NHS just to have Extension Rebellion or something listed on the, um, by the counter-terrorism police? I mean, in practice, it probably won't have... Um, much of an impact i think again it's just much more revealing mm. of what the purpose of prevent has always been which is about managing 
political subjectivity, you know, managing how people think and feel vis-a-vis the government and that, um, you know, it belongs to that age-old strategy, you know, ever since World War II, that we need to collect as much information as possible about how people think and how they feel, um, and thereby actually listing as many organizations as possible just gives mm. more incentive to collect as much information as you can about as many yeah. people as possible. Mm. Um, and this is something that's really, really well known. I'll be honest with you at this whole thing with Extinction Rebellion. Um, I didn't really, it didn't phase me too much. Um, I think there was a part of it where I think many of us had these conversations that such expansions were inevitable. Okay. Not because you hate the environment. I really hate the environment. (laughs) Um, but yeah, no, I think it's not, you know, it's just one of those questions of, you know, this was an, this was an inevitability. Mm. And so what, what is it that we're tasked to do right now? Again, it brings, it brings us back to this whole dilemma whereby people are going to start pointing fingers that we're not really the extremists, you know, and the extremists mm. are really out there. Yeah. And that, that's what you're alluding to. And I think, you know, as you were mm. saying, Rob, you know, they did, they did well in positioning themselves and saying, well, actually Muslims have been discriminated against. But I think people still have a very hard time in trying to understand, well, um, surely, you know, it just, it's a manner, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of fine tuning, right? And this was fine, Mm. fine tuning gone wrong, Mm. whereby we just need to fine tune it a little bit better. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the lens has to shift away from the people, you know, who's an extremist, who's not an extremist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to reverse that lens towards what the purpose of this term is actually achieving. Yeah. You know, and that's bringing it back towards yeah. the government. And it should really not be the government who is defining who, who are, who's extremist and who's mm-hmm. not. Um, you know, this is. They this should is, have some kind of independent commission. <laughs> yeah, there should be an independent commission. Hopefully, someone, I don't know, I'm guessing some someone, Khan or something. Who's be, yeah. Brown? Maybe themselves. you actually, right? You're, <laughs> yeah. No, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, but I, th- I think that's where where when you look at what's come out. I mean, I'm 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 a, I'm a big fan. I think I think everyone here is of, of imminent critique. You need to look at exact look at what's going on, and what those documents mm. do for us is there was you know some of the people had pointed out very quickly that they had on one page they had. Um, fascists and there was a, there was a symbol for there was a there was a swastika yeah. and then on the next page they had exactly the same single symbol but had like the no smoking bar through it because it was for an, the anti-fascist group mm. and and both of these groups yeah. were seen as seen as seen as extreme and so you, you need to i mean this is my, this is my hope with i was talking to a to a journalist the other, the other day and, and she was kind of saying but like don't you realize you're bashing your head up against a brick wall trying to trying to change any of this and I mean, it is my my firm belief that that the more ridiculous this gets, mm. it, it's gotta it's gotta it's gotta you know go away at some point. It's gotta be be revealed for what it is. And I and I think that now this this week in the last few days seems to be a an important moment. Um, there seems to be a lack of leadership around what's going on with Prevent. Yeah. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that we've had the independent review of counterterrorism legislation was removed just before Christmas um, because because of there was there was a the legal challenge from Rights Watch. So he gets removed because he's clearly biased. He's 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 the, the main defender. I mean, he literally Prevent. said, yeah. I am Look, biased towards uh, Prevent. Yeah. You know, there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a review, you know? And, and he, he, um, he wrote the... I yeah. didn't realize until this until, until I Lord went Carlyle. back. To, Lord Carlyle yeah. wrote wrote the introduction to the prevent strategy. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Work under. He know, was the one who crazy. also suggested that it needs to be expanded in public yeah. bodies, and he was mm, saying, yeah. "Well, there's not enough help. Why? Why are all these doctors yeah. not <laughs> looking out but for it, counter radicalization?" Yeah. But, but anyway, what, what that means though is that there is a there's a I mean everything that's going on with this current government is messy, but there's something particularly messy going on with prevent because. So the options that the government have got mm. is that there is a they have to deliver according to the statute in January last year the Counterterrorism Border Security Act said that they had to deliver the independent review of prevent by this July no, no August by this August 
So they've removed Lord Carlyle because they didn't follow a due process to 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 recruit him. Mm -hmm. So if they now follow a correct procurement or whatever recruitment process to to find someone else, that's going to take them five months. So that gives mm -hmm. them them one month to do a full independent review of print. So they don't have time to deliver on the statute. Mm -hmm. So they've got this super majority, which means they can do anything in Parliament. But but that's so. So are they going to change the statute to give themselves more time? But if they're going to change the statute, it means there's going to have to be a debate about it. Um, there is a potential that public opinion beyond just Muslims who know what the experience mm. of prevent is, but the rest of the population now are starting to become aware that this might be problematic. So it just seems that things might change. Yeah. And, and also not to forget that there is a... I, I don't agree with the overarching philosophy, but the certain aspects of my politics that are aligned with the kind of the libertarian side of the, of the conservatives who are, there, there are a lot of right wing people mm. who are against prevent as well for on a libertarian ticket. So yeah. there's, I, I there's remember, kind of lots um, moving around. In 2015, we had this campaign, um, stop the bill for the CTS bill. Mm. Now CTS Act, spoiler alert, went through. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Peter Hitchens oh, was really, yeah, I was gonna uh, say he's, yeah, yeah, really kind of um, cooperative. He, yeah. he he met me, recorded a video with him, you know, talking about, you know, the tentacles of state uh, kind of control mm -hmm. going into, and obviously yeah. that's his kind of political kind of angle, the libertarian. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there is a there is a, there is there is a case for a broad consensus mm. uh, against prevent, and I think largely it has become toxic over the yeah. years, and I think. Um, you know, initially it was the Muslim community who, you know, had to take credit for everyone. But uh, it's like organizations like Cage, mostly, you know, yeah. um, who are trying to, you know, uh, change change the uh, the discourse that we, we speak about prevent uh, through. And now you see, you know, uh, you know, at universities on, on, on campus, you know, if you just do um, a show of hands with the audience, People will, people will say, yeah, it's, it's you know, we, we don't like it, it's rubbish, you know, young Muslims. But it's it's already had a massive, um, you know, uh, impact. So the dam a lot of damage has been yeah. done because a lot yeah. of Islamic societies, for example, are scared to invite speakers or, or they just don't want to have the headache of jumping through all those hoops. Yeah. Hence the chilling kind of yeah. effect. Um, what else have you kind of noticed in terms of over the years? How has the, 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 the discourse Mm. Uh, on prevent changed i mean i think i'll play devil's advocate here and suggest that in fact we're seeing more of an evolution than we're seeing its end mm. i think it's always <coughs> been constantly evolving and this is how the problem for for many people you know if anyone's listening to this and they want to research prevent you know that's a terrible idea <laughs> just don't do that in fact, you shouldn't really look at any of these policies. We need, to, we need to look through these policies, right? It's a mm. discussion that we constantly have. What are these policies telling us about how the government is, you know, instituting policies, you know, the political environment, things like that? Um, but one of the main reasons we don't want to look at prevent specifically is because it's so quickly evolving and it changes mm. so rapidly. Um, and I think... You know, given the 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 very significant rise of nationalist politics across the global north, you know, not only here in the UK but everywhere else, you know, this type of logic that prevent is providing is one that is very lucrative as an industry, mm -hmm. um, and in fact, that many Muslims buy into, right? Yeah. So again, it's always that I think when I when I did my research on prevent, I found that. You know, many Muslims are also very quickly, I mean, I'm talking about if I were to just go to a random mosque and speak with people, you know, I think people are very quickly to say, well, it just needs to sort of be shifted towards white people. You know, if it was better <laughs> at catching white people, <laughs> you know, you know, that would be sort of the, the sort of Batman that we need. Mm. Right. Um, Have you actually heard that? Batman? No, no, no. I mean, Muslims saying... Yeah, I mean, I've, 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 it, it actually shows up. It actually comes up. If you ever go to like these public right, prevent like events, um, you know, there's many people involved who generally espouse that view that, you know, it, you know, it's funny to me. I'm just going to say this tangentially. Prevent has such a bad brand, you know, that like 
there's there's many people even i think there was there, there was that mayor's um there was a sort of oh, yeah 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 there was a meeting or a discussion yeah. that included google and the at, mayor of a, london google, yeah. and i don't know who was it who among the speakers had mentioned this but one of them stated very explicitly that we're, we're not prevent mm. you know we want to do something counter extremism but we're not prevent mm. and you know i'm surprised i i tried to take note of that but there's so many people who are trying to distance themselves from prevent yeah, yeah. But by distancing, distancing themselves from prevent as a policy, they're really not actually addressing the logic. That's the problem. They're right? still using the but language I, of extremism. But I think, going back to your point about the people who, uh, that the people that, that start on the wrong foot with an argument against prevent, which is which is the people who slip in, and it's at every every event that we've been to, every event that I've ever talked to, there's someone who'll stick their hand up in the audience and they'll they'll argue about prevent being improved and you you point out to them that are you are you aware that you're arguing for more prevent yeah here? and 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 but they people always yeah. realize think, that and they then they go oh yeah i, yeah. I get it and, and so that it's kind of lazy yeah. thinking that i that think that's part is. of the uh, uh, i also kind of criticize ourselves our own organizations that when we criticize prevent we kind of um we we we, we give the impression that we're against them some kind of misapplication of pro or, exactly. you know all the mm. terrorist house and cooker bomb and that kind of, those yeah. kind of stories they're important to get kind of attention to it but they don't actually address the mm. the the systemic issues as the yeah. science underlying the science Precisely. underlying yeah. prevent right and that's it's, uh, that's it and i think i mean i was just gonna say you know sometimes i see that hashtag and prevent right yeah. a lot of muslims share it which is good I think we need to like be very clear, as Cage has been and as other organizations, the Transnational Institute, et cetera. You know, to me, the main argument I can make very easily that I think most people can immediately appreciate is that we absolutely, the, the prevent duty, the duty of prevent, <laughs> sounds, you know, a duty funny, with yeah. all the meanings associated with yeah. it, the duty of prevent uh, should be abolished like immediately. Right. That should have never existed. Yeah. If we're talking about systemic discrimination, we're talking about, you know, the absolutely atrocious record of human rights abuses, et cetera, that's going on. All the sort of secretive, you know, sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, things that are going on in terms of references and who's being referenced and who's being collected in a database. And we don't have access to any of this. You know, that that duty was absolutely the worst possible sort of manifestation mm -hmm. of this. But just even if we were to remove the prevent duty, we haven't at all address the logic mm -hmm. of how this policy was able to succeed, not only as a policy, but as a product, right? It's mm -hmm. something that's sold so easily to the population that, you know, you could just tell them like, look, we have the algorithms, we have the information systems, you know, we can predict human behavior. And so mm -hmm. let's, let's do it. You know, and people are going to be like, yeah, we can finally stop crime. You know, we can stop <laughs> violence. And yet we sort of live in an age of violence. You know, look what Paris is burning right now as we yeah. speak, you know. Um, so, you know, there is this there is this sort of like this huge dissonance between the product that's being sold. And you can you can feel the comfort that it provides for people. Yes. Finally, we can predict human behavior, yeah. which, as we know, We'll never be able to do, you know, you know, people in prevent, they love to say, we don't really believe in the conveyor belt mm -hmm. theory, you know, that's. And then, the, and then you say, what, it, what do you believe in? <laughs> yeah, what I do mean, you believe in? Oh, it's a science. The science yeah, it's, it's, it's a science, yeah. you know, it's the sort of idea that there's a hundred million factors. We recognize yeah. the complexity in practice, by the way. Yeah. They actually, the truth of the matter is they don't believe in one conveyor belt theory. They believe in like hundreds of conveyor belt theories, mm -hmm. right? It's just many sort of conveyor belts, which is why they bring in these, this, like this list of all yeah. these various but, associations. But, then, but, yeah, but So uh, just for the, the audience yeah. at home, what does conveyor belt theory mean? Well, the conveyor belt theory suggests that, you know, if we can attend to someone's certain behaviors that are potentially risk factors, Mm -hmm. uh, and we can define them as such and we can calculate that if someone has this behavior, let's say on a very simple note, and I'm not exaggerating here, they're angry, right? They're angry yeah. towards the state in, in any way, shape or form that that means they're potentially on a conveyor belt of becoming a radical in the future. Yeah. <clears throat> um, which is why, as you can see, which, which yeah. shouldn't be a problem being a radical. Yeah. In a democracy. 
I mean, by but, definition, it mustn't be a problem if we live in a democracy. So <laughs> that that's what would be yeah. ideally. Yeah, I mean, this is what a liberal democracy cool. should be, technically, yeah. right? Um, you know, theoretically, you know, liberal democracy should be able to sustain the anger of the population, be able to sort of translate it, mm. right? But um, you know, and we should mention, by the way, it, people in Prevent they they espouse all these ideals rhetorically. You know, they're going to say, yeah, of course, we want people to be politically yeah. radical. I just really want to mention specifically to any Muslims listening to this, because I often hear I've been to many conferences, workshops um, and, you know, speaking with higher ups. And there's this constant push towards, you know, you sort of like re retaking the language. You know, we should we should promote radicalism. Yeah, you know, yeah. radicalization <clears throat> as a positive thing. Yeah, and it, that happens in at a local level in schools. They they, yeah. they try and deliver mm -hmm. deliver prevent by looking at radicals through history and. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's really, really? important. Yeah. Anyone anyone who's not white middle yeah. class who's listening to this, uh, you should definitely never do that. <laughs> Just that's not how la yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. not how language works. Okay. <laughs> so you should definitely not go to school and just say, "Yeah, I'm a radical now because you know prevent told me that's a good idea." Yeah. Um, I like that's skateboarding. A, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's a really really terrible idea. I actually have a really big problem with that. You mm. could you can you can sense the privilege coming from people who speak that way. Yeah, right. Mm. Because in a way, they just it just shows that they simply mm. have no understanding of how language works, or the 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 commonsensical association between certain non-white bodies, you know, brown, mm -hmm. black, whatever, and threat. If they were to just yeah. go ahead and say, "I'm a radical." Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows what's going to happen to them? It's such such terrible mm -hmm. advice. Um, so, I mean, one of the things, obviously, it might have sound it might have sounded earlier that I was suggesting that you know we don't want the government to define extremism, but I think we also we need to find a way to overcome this language altogether. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem with these words and these concepts, as you know, right? I mean, in a way, we're we're we have we're not coming to a table whereby we're going to decide what, what it is and how it can be defined. It's already going to have all these associations according to how the British public s understands these concepts to, to represent in terms of people, mm -hmm. right? But we already know that 60% of conservative vo voters from a recent survey believe that Islam, I, I, I think they said Islam is a threat to a British mm -hmm. way of life. Yeah. And mm -hmm. there's been continuously these surveys conducted over and over again. In fact, if anyone wants any hard evidence why prevention never have been a public duty, it's all these surveys suggesting that people, you know, yeah. just commonsensically associate threat with Muslims. But but mm -hmm. then but then you, you also need to recognize that there's that that is the logic of prevent. You know, that's yeah. so that's that's why it's there. And that So it's worked. Yeah. And and yes, yeah. but it's but also I want to go back to your point, Tarek, about saying how it was it was it's easy to sell this stuff. It's easy to sell this stuff now, but the you know the the, the prevent training, the rap training was I think it was it was floating around for seven years before it was mm. eventually taken up by schools. So the Home Office were trying to push this this agenda to to police dissent mm. for a long time, and and it only and it took them to invent you know people have talked about astroturfing invent all these fake muslim organizations mm. and other fake civil society organizations yeah to that are directly funded by the home office at the moment it's the building stronger <coughs> britain together which is a joint effort by mc sarchi and the home office mm. to create these fake and it can't be said enough they are fake community organizations which from then within raiku yeah, from created yeah. by 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 well, it's well. This is so it was Riku, but now building a stronger Britain together okay. is part Super. of the counter extremism unit, and and they've now they now do it in the open. It's mm. become because it's, so it's become so normalised. But what that what that does is that it, you end up with this this feedback loop where they they're putting money into an organisation to pay that organisation to keep their funding. They need to keep saying that counter extremism is a good idea. Yeah. And, and that's then used as the justification for it. And you've got all these other feedback loops. Like, so, so one of the, the big, for me, the big driver for Prevent, why it really took off is the Counterterrorism Security Act that you talked about in yeah. 2015 was when the duty came in to make, make Prevent a duty. But in fact, from I was teaching down the road from here, in a school down the road from here at the time, 
and we or we'd implemented prevent six months before that and we implemented prevent because off the back of the trojan horse hoax in birmingham mm -hmm. ofsted changed their inspection regime and said that to pass an inspection you have to to adopt prevent and the british values not uh, yeah and british values and all that so so <coughs> and te teachers head teachers they, if prevent say you have to do something, they do mm. it because you the head, at least the head teacher is going to lose their job if they don't do it. And then, and I've had it quoted to me on a number of occasions in the Home Office and in panel discussions that prevent is wanted by head teachers, and they're quote they're quoting that that all head teachers or ninety percent of head teachers have said they're happy with their implementation of prevent, mm. which they have to say to keep <laughs> their jobs. Um, but 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 this is quite, yeah, this is told yeah. to me in in good faith. Yeah. By, you know, people that, that Tarek and I have argued with at the Home Office repeatedly, they say this stuff. So in they forced head teachers to implement Prevent. And say that they did they it well. To prove Prevent is a good thing or has yeah. support, they say, look how many head teachers are dealing with it, working yeah. with it. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's, that's mm. all these justifications that have, and now that, that's become kind of baked in. And again, and then going back to the language, as long as we, Tarek's exactly right, as long as we keep talking about extremism, and I mean, I, you must have been seeing me doing that yeah. 5,000 times because I never say extremism without doing that because yeah. it's, it's such a problematic concept. But as, as long as we say extremism, then we, we, we normalize the idea that we have yeah. to do something. And actually, that was one of my experiences of getting into Prevent. I was on the Tower Hamlets Overview and Scrutiny Committee into Prevent a few years back in sort of 2014, 2015. And even though even back then I was a vehement critic of Prevent, but I found that every time anyone in the room started talking about extremism or radicalization, I felt myself sort of had this sort of cognitive dissonance going on where it's like something, but something has to be done about this, doesn't it? And then that was where my PhD came in to work out. So if you look at the language and you see that these, these words didn't exist five years ago, yeah. then that allows you to wind the clock back and go all oh, right well if they didn't exist then we can consider what they what they mean and that we don't necessarily need them and if we yeah. don't need them we don't mm -hmm. need counter extremism we don't need riku we don't need the counter extremism unit at the home office sometimes i feel that the words although they didn't <coughs> exist you know 10 20 years ago um it feels like the the progenitors of these words were more you know packy <coughs> Or kind of mm. racial slurs. It mm. feels that I mean, in terms of if you look at the the way it's been used in the discourse, especially recently in the merging with um, integration kind of uh, rhetoric. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm gonna gonna. I, th I think you know you're 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 one of the good ones. You're not one of the mm. yeah, but, you know, yeah. I'm not racist. Ones, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like but no, I think I yeah. think that's it's definitely emer you know emerges mm. from just old fashioned racism. Yeah. Um, yeah. But th there's there's I'll try, and I'll try and explain this briefly, but something that, that's come up in most research is when you look at parliamentary debates over the last hundred years, mm -hmm. before Tony Blair's maiden speech in 2000, no, sorry, in 1983, the word extremist is always used by um, right-wing politicians in parliament to describe left-wing politicians, or no, to describe left-wing voters. Mm -hmm. And so what they say is that the right-wing politicians say, you, we need to watch out because if we enact this oppressive policy, then there will be more extremists will emerge and they'll vote in the left. So the left with the extremists. Yeah. And and, that, and there's a kind of cross-referencing of that or a triangulation of that by left-wing um, left, left politicians say, they, they offer the same warning. They say to the right, they say, <clears throat> well, you need to watch out if you do that because people are going to vote for us. And it goes one step further that there are a few, a few debates where left-wing politicians, after the welfare state has been formed, they celebrate the loss of Labour seats. And they're celebrating because social justice mm. has been delivered. They didn't, people didn't need to vote for them anymore. So, you know, things were going well. And then what, what Tony Blair does in his maiden speech is he starts describing extreme, those extremists as a threat to his party. Oh. So he that's that this is the shift to centrism. Mm -hmm. And so I I'm a strong believer in this in well it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a mucky messy system and it's imperfect but the parliamentary system that we have in place at the moment does have the as long as you have the argument then you end up getting some kind of moderation out yeah. of the policy. Um and so since 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 extremism became a threat to the left, and don't forget it was New Labour that created the first counter-extremism strategies, yeah. the first version of Prevent. 
th that whole parliamentary calculus, that whole balancing act that was going on in Parliament has been completely lost. And I would argue that that is one of the, one of the reasons that we've since then, since you Labour, had this race to the right, because there's no, none of that moderating facts. There's, you never hear in Parliament anymore, you haven't heard in Parliament for the last decade, someone on the left saying you need to watch out for that policy because more people are going to vote for us it's just not that's just not part of the discourse anymore but that was that was constantly in debates mm. before you know going going back over the last hundred years mm. okay well i was um i had something in mind to do because i was afraid that there's going to be too many phds and too much intellectual talk so i wanted to dumb things down a bit um if you just move your cup for a second i've got a um a representative from the uh the Commission for Countering Extremism here, because um, you know we don't want to, in the interest of balance and all that, um, in this little uh, little uh, ideas bowl, uh, we've got a few uh, uh, numbers, and those numbers correspond to uh, actual questions and tweets and stuff I saw from pro prevent people. Um, so I'll give you, I'll give you the honours of uh, lifting up. Uh, so you want me to just pull out the poop? <laughs> up, uh, yeah. Lift up the d the perennial. <laughs> yeah. It should I'm be one thing, just, uh, uh, one thing attached to him. <laughs> <laughs> this is a cool. Uh, oh, cool it's idea. each each yeah. clip, yeah. each uh, feces so. represents a terrible idea. I'm assuming. <laughs> it's uh, the prevent duty. <laughs> <laughs> that should be uh, the next sort of push. Yeah, we just call it prevent duty instead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so these represent these. Did you actually write this on toilet paper? Yeah. No, no, no. It's not. I mean, I'm yeah, saying that's, that's an impressive <laughs> yeah, effect. It's good somebody. It's uh, a, and it's only Rob and I who are going to appreciate this detail. <laughs> it's going to get a good Can we get a close up? <laughs> it's good to have you your. You could have done it on regular paper, yeah, but good. you actually did it on <laughs> tissue. It's, it's good to have your work acknowledged. <laughs> this is actually tissue. I it's thought it'd be too tissue, disrespectful so. to do it on. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a five. It's actually a it's actually kitchen roll. So, and if anyone, it hasn't been used. <laughs> okay, so one, two, three, four, five. Uh, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. So, that's, yeah, that's I so mean, that mainstream. That was that was. Yeah, I was yeah. on Radio Four Moral Maze the other day, and exactly that that was told. That was said to me. Okay. So. so I so mean, it it's, it's, yeah. su it's such a, I mean, it's also really been discussed to death at this yeah. point. And mm -hmm. I think it, you know, if anyone who's listening um, is interested in, in sort of hearing more about how the discipline of terror or terrorism developed, you know, I really recommend the book. Um, it's actually called Disciplining Terror. Um, and, you know, she, if you actually look at it historically, how was terrorism always sort of allocated as a term? Mm. Um you know, you'll notice even she gives examples of how like an attack on Israeli soil was considered an act of terrorism, but the same sort of, you know, similar act, you mm. know, conducted on Palestinian <laughs> soil wasn't. And this comes down to this idea of how do we code, et cetera. You know, I mean, in a way, if you want to really sort of. So in a way, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> in a way actually yeah. <laughs> how are we how are we even differentiating between yeah. what sort of violence it is and is not ideological and it comes down even to racist acts of violence yeah. you know someone i had someone once approach me on the street in berlin and he was he was about to attack me right i mean the only reason why the attack didn't go through is because i had a friend who stopped him and he was able to and stop him before some, uh, i sort of recognized moves. what was happening sorry and you got some <laughs> sick moves yeah yeah i was already uh, <laughs> i was already in the bus <laughs> while my friend was fighting him off. um <laughs> but you know the person who was attacking me he was screaming you know you're dirt get out of my country you're dirt right so let's pretend he killed me so he didn't re really didn't like canadians he really <laughs> really didn't like canadians uh, yeah i think um Must yeah. be the accent <laughs> that was it that was it uh so let's pretend he killed me Right. I mean, at that point, how many attack, racist attacks have occurred yeah. that are ideologically motivated yeah. that we can trace to what ideology, what are sort of political motivations? We can trace all these things. Right. Mm. So at the end of the day, you know, terrorism has always been a highly questionable construct. <clears throat> and so when people bring up these these terms, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, what they're really just admitting to is their own ignorance of mm -hmm. being able to think even remotely critically of mm -hmm. what terrorism is, you know, how is it defined, you know, how is it, how's the data been collected, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that lends itself to just how easily 
manipulated people are in terms mm. of the sort of you know the sort of political rhetoric that can but then it, shift them in any direction that they want. I think it's it's a, it's a difficult one, the terrorism, because I was um, someone from from a from a Muslim organization. I'm not going to I won't, won't name them right now, but someone from a, a, a Muslim organization um, phoned me up <coughs> the day after the Christchurch attack mm -hmm. and was asking me about what was my opinion on whether they should name it as terrorism. So this was a white lone wolf terrorist attack. And and it was it was it was it was an interesting conversation because I complete, I agreed with the sentiment that terrorism is a useless term it's an unhelpful term, mm -hmm. but then in that instance it's a kind of the argument for more prevent isn't it like yeah. I, I, so my advice was well I think that ship has sailed we're using that word now and to decide not to use it even if you're deciding not to use it for this kind of meta theory that we ought not to be using terrorism on the white guy in Christchurch yeah. is is problematic as well. So we kind of, we kind of, that for me was an example of why in some instances we're stuck having to use the language. Um, what about I, the argument that once we use it more and more and it becomes clearly a more and more absurd for everyone to see, when you, for example, start applying it to um, white people or non-Muslims who do similar crimes to Muslims who are labeled as Muslims? I really disagree with this logic, terrorism. I must admit. I think the more we use it, the word terrorism will always, always uh, privilege a certain population. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I think there's no way to expand it that it won't. I mean, even Alexander Bissonnet, the, the, the Quebec shooter, mm -hmm. the, the Quebec mosque shooter, he wasn't charged with terrorism. Mm. I mean, we want to then what we want to argue that this person should be charged with terrorism. Yeah. And the I think there's a difference between charging someone under terrorism laws yeah. because terrorism laws clearly there's an argument that they're, mm. they're useless. There's no need yeah. for them, and they, we have enough laws yeah. to you know yeah. for criminal behavior. But the word terrorism, you know, in in terms of getting out of getting it out of our language, what about kind of diluting it to the point where it's completely absurd? I don't think we have that power. You know, I so, it, so, it, so it, what's it, but what I, what's the move then? What do we? You know, I think that lends itself to a much bigger conversation. You know, I'm sure about language and you know to what it, to what extent you know we're able to go past these sort of terms that are incredibly incredibly racist at, mm. at their mm. at their foundations. Um, I think anything that is very well recognized to be racist shouldn't be used, yeah. such as a term like terrorism. Um, I think we can just we can always demand that we're specifying the exact behavior. I mean, if someone, because someone can be called a terrorist, as we know from the recent criminal, uh, you know, the mm. Criminal Terrorism Act of 2019, because they recklessly supported ISIS, for example, right? So mm. they said or did something that somehow reflected that group, and therefore, you know, they're going to start being called terrorists at that point. Um, but it can also now reflect someone's behavior for taking a van and, you know, driving mm -hmm. over a bunch of Muslim congregants, leaving a mosque. So the term itself, I think either we specify it very specific, mm -hmm. like we have to agree that when we mention it, this is what I mean by terrorism. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, fine, if someone wants to talk about it that way, yeah. but in a way you're not, you're only lending, I think, more oxygen to that discussion. Yeah. I, I'd mm -hmm. rather just, I'd rather go beyond it. You know, if you're going to label a certain act as political violence. So let's have a wider discussion of what political violence is. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I mean, I'd rather always shift that gaze back towards, towards power. Look up, you know, mm -hmm. you got to punch up. Mm -hmm. Who is not, if, if we're using terrorism, who is not right now currently being allowed to be seen, uh, you know, within the realm of terrorists or extremists or radicals and one thing we know for sure is the political class right i mean mm -hmm. we know politicians can literally say anything that's extreme right and just get away with it unless you're jeremy corbyn unless you're jeremy corbyn yeah, yeah i mean he uh he or, or any, anyone on the left yeah, yeah. Or anyone so on the left any, but, anyone who steps outside of the neoliberal agenda I mean, even then, I think, you know, Noam Chomsky in a, in a book, he mentions, you know, he has a, a really small point, which I thought was so observant of him. And, you know, he was asked by an audience member, well, you know, he's been so critical of the U.S. So why is it that he hasn't been like shut down? Like, you know, mm -hmm. imagine if mm -hmm. any one of us, 
you know, at least any one of us <laughs> were, were as, oh, as, radical, no, as radical or yeah. as critical as Noam yeah. Chomsky has been. Um, you know, we can really I mean, imagine. The most he's, he's described as a far left writer or something. Mm. Yeah. He's uh, like a but I mean, Noam Chomsky, I think, was, yeah. was, he was very reflexive because yeah. he was saying like, look, you know, I'm an old white man. You know, I mean, they, if anyone tries to shut me down, in any way, shape, or form, it often reflects, you know, I reflect the exact qualities of the people who are shutting us down, yeah. you know? So he's sort of like a no-go zone, you know? You, you got to sort of mm. let him be able to go around and speak because you shut, you shut down someone like Noam Chomsky. You're shutting mm. down a certain, a certain sort of set of criteria or qu characteristics yeah. that we don't want to shut down. Um, and so I don't have an answer to this. I think, though, as a rule of thumb, I avoid, I, I avoid radicalization. You know, um, <laughs> that's a relief. I, I, I have to say that, you know, for the sake of my family, prevent. my wife always tells me, you know, be sure that, <laughs> you know, be sure you get that statement out there. Yeah. Um, but you know, you mean but you, avoid you know, getting caught. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'll do that even, let's say, with depression. You know, someone mm. comes to me and says they're depressed. You know, I can have 10 people come to me and say that they're, they're depressed, but the, the label eventually is meaningless when you actually start opening up the people's experiences, mm, right? Yeah. And I think there's something, you know, I understand that there is an element of shorthand that's <clears throat> necessary. That shorthand should never be institutionalized to the level of governance, which, which is what we're seeing with radicalization. But moreover, you know, I think there is something about you know, the fact that giving oxygen to something as racist as radicalization or terrorism <clears throat> is only fueling a fire mm -hmm. that we won't ever mm -hmm. be able to control. And I think case in point here is actually all these surveillance capitalists, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they're all in on this. Mm -hmm. And we know that the, 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 the sort of unregulated expansion of surveillance technologies mm -hmm. Uh, that Google and Facebook and others have been able to employ is specifically a result of the war on terror. Yeah. yeah. Right? <clears throat> I mean, right now we're entering, I think, uh, you know, there's a book called uh, The Age of Surveil Surveillance Capitalism. I, 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 I really agree with sort of the idea that we're entering an age right now where really all our behaviors and thoughts, mm. you know, are, are, are being codified, are being analyzed, reharvested, resold back to us in different ways. And, um, and transmission. <laughs> <laughs> and but, that, we, but that's, that's the yeah. hypocrisy, isn't it? That, that the, and I think it is worth talking about left and right, that the right has this, 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 this belief in being realists and that's the way the world is. But then we'll use for a corporate agenda. <clears throat> yeah will use data to manipulate people. Mm. So it's like you, you, you are fixed as being a Muslim and having a certain radical agenda, but then for this corporate agenda, that's fine. We can, we can alter what we want, how we want people to, people to be. And it's just this, this rank hypocrisy at the heart mm. of, of the right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, unless, uh, oh yeah, sorry. You want to go through too intellectual poop. again. <laughs> uh, your turn, Rob. Okay. <laughs> By the way, do you um, speaking of terrorism? Um, do you um, use the global terrorism in uh, database? GT, GT. Do I use it? Yeah. I mean, that person or who and stuff. attacked me on the street would have technically yeah. counted, you know, based on their definition. He should have been a statistic. Yeah but he's not because mm -hmm. even in in that i mean it's it's funded by the department for homeland security so it's not exactly some you know uh friendly whatever mm. you can argue but yeah. even that do you know um sometimes in my spare time i'm kind of a boring person um i just go and use the advanced search feature right <laughs> okay so, uh, oh boy <laughs> <laughs> so the the, uh, the 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 latest complete year they have for the uk statistics of um attacks described as terrorism they have a few bit of nuance in that yeah um so the most broad kind of all the buttons checked from um first january to 31st december 2018 do you know how many terrorist attacks there were either foiled or successful ones i'm not even gonna Let's try do a guess. Little, uh, do a little no idea in the uk yeah, yeah. It's, this is this is the thing of, of it, it, the big question is know. is how 
who's uh, who's told us how many yeah. they foiled? <laughs> so that's Yo, you're including foil. This, no, this I, is I catch this is word. actually this is actually um, done by what's reported in the news. Yeah, right? it's always done by what's yeah. reported in the yeah. news. So it's highly problematic. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So, so what is it? Uh, any guesses? No, I'm not. Uh, it's, guess. it's it's hovering around the hundred. I can't remember exactly. The whatever year before was 103. Yeah. I can't remember exactly my mind. But, this, uh, but the, the, the whole thing of foiled terrorist attacks yeah. is, this is again, this is, it's worth, worth considering. It's, it's only in recent years that we now have the, the, the British security yeah. services used to hover around in the background, apparently keeping us safe. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that some of that, James Bond, some of that did happen. They were James Bond. They, they made sure that there wasn't a panic on the streets and they yeah. kept us safe and doing as, History, you know, brilliant reporters mm. like Ian Cobain and his book, The History Thieves, have revealed that they did some really, really nasty things over the years, and they probably continue to do some really, really nasty things. Um, but they did it in the background. It's mm. only in the last few years that we get, we now get press conferences held by the head of head of the security services telling us, and we're meant to trust them, how many how many yeah. plots have been foiled. So, so they're now part of this, the same agenda that those, those fake civil society organizations are part of to, to maintain their funding, to show that they're needed, to show yeah, they're doing important yeah. work. The security apparatus is doing this and, 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 they're, and it's in their interest. This is another one of those feedback loops. It's in their interest to hold a press conference that I just walked in Liverpool Street, just walked past a load of, a load of counterterrorism police with guns. It's in their interest to make sure that everyone is yeah. scared because then they get more funding yeah. and we've got this constant feedback that's feedback and everything the, that's that's the systemic issue that's the systemic yeah. part of it that's one it's a major major issue yeah. and by but the way i think if, like that sort of future oriented risk aversion yeah. is something that we can we can document goes back a long time right yeah. it's just right now with technology it's been able to be it's a, it's been able to be streamlined yeah. so yeah. efficiency so you really want you know you really want yeah. to just dig into that poop you know <laughs> just take it out man Go on. Well, no, about, you gotta just about the just to, yeah. to complete the gtd thing the yeah. global tourism yeah. thing database how many of those 103 foiled or successful attacks were carried out by muslims or planned by muslims take a guess very few i don't know Quarter. i mean it Give could me be 50 percent, 50 50 i think so they 50 like what do you think 25 percent. three Three. Okay. This is the this G D G T D. Yeah. It's not like some Muslim friendly organization yeah, yeah. like MCB yeah. or something. They said out of the hundred and three odd terrorist attacks, including foiled ones, only three of them were quote unquote either Muslim extremist or jihadi inspired. They have a few names. So I just kind of went through them. So it would have been a nice round those. number if it wasn't for the Muslims. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the majority are basically um kind of yeah. uh, Irish, either Republicans or Unionists. Or yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, I understand. Which, which, and, and that's um, the, 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 the appreciation of the, st the state's theorizing, yeah. to the extent there is any theory of, of, around Republican terrorism, um, is, you know, there is no counter-extremism policy or prevent in Northern Ireland. Yeah. And, and I've found over the years, if you speak to people in the army about prevent, they, particularly older people who, who served in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, they immediately, they're the first people to, the first white people to go, oh, this is a problem. Because they've, they've seen that. The, and they I think this is, happens, this, yeah. it, the interesting thing is, is that the army, for, for all of the, the, the atrocities that, that the army have done over the years, you know, and you know, I think mm. every, anyone would accept that. That, that they have a long institutional memory. So they learn stuff and they change, which is why, you know, if you look at the war on terror in the, in the US, it's the mm -hmm. CIA, the civilian body that does the really bad stuff because civil service <laughs> changes quickly and it has a short mm -hmm. institutional memory, whereas the, the military has a, has a longer, longer memory. Yeah. Um, so they don't do yeah. stuff like prevent. I, I just want to add a quick point because I think, I think, we need to also <clears throat> give a sort of historical take on this. And I'm just going to do this very quickly mm. um, because we can, I think we can talk about um, terrorism databases and all that for a long time. Fanaticism is not a new concept, right? And I, I think in a way... Yeah, well, I have um, a sh fair share of my fans as well. <laughs> have you guys? <laughs> Uh, so I see you have a lot of fanatics following you. <laughs> we can't say that out loud. So, uh, so fan is short for, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Twitter, I, I, I think it's just important to mention that, you know, I think there's a lot of historical 
sort of analysis you can do of how, you know, according to different countries, how the governments would define who the fanatics are, yeah. right? And we know we know that like Martin Luther King was considered an extremist, and I think these are sort of ideas that are um, mm. generally understood. But I think there's a particular thing about Islam and Muslims, um, and we 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 need to sort of highlight the fact. In fact, there's a really good book called um, "Fanaticism on the Use of an Idea," um, and it traces sort of a, a history of fanaticism going back to the Enlightenment. And one thing that's fanaticism very or fanaticism, fanaticism, the, the use which one the, is following you? So, <laughs> <laughs> so the use of fanaticism as the a, use of fanaticism as as a as, a, as like a label, okay. you know, you're right. a fanatic, yeah. I'm a fanatic, who's a fanatic, right? Mm -hmm. So we know it's really ambiguous. And in fact, mm -hmm. the the author of the book, um, Alberto Toscano, he, he actually shows how certain people were calling other people fanatics. But by a different definition, they were fanatics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But that's not really the point. One of the things I think he highlights really well is that, in fact, uh, you know, throughout Western history, at least starting from the Enlightenment, that we can recognize, Islam was always the quintessential sort of fanaticism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You understand? There's a history of Western civilization vis-a-vis -vis Islam and Muslims, vis-a-vis yeah. -vis particularly Muslim subjectivity, yeah. that's always had, there's always been a sort of issue, you know, to what extent we can allow, you know, Muslims to sort of, um, you know, I mean, not even allow, you know, to what extent, you know, Muslim subjectivity can ever be a part of European civilization. What example. do you mean Muslim subjectivity there for? Well, just... I mean in the sense that, you know, um, this idea, I mean, it can Because your can Muslim itself... subjectivity will be different to... Yeah, but yeah. I, but I think but this, this, Der <laughs> Derrida <laughs> takes this further and, and makes the point yeah. repeatedly that Europe can't exist without Islam. Yeah. yeah. Without, without a foreign view of Islam. Exactly. Europe doesn't to exist. To define its <clears throat> other. To to find find and, and 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 you know this is why in you know in, in our living memory there's been so much there was so much debate around turkey joining joining the yeah, eu and Tur yeah, turkey sure. could never be allowed to join the eu because because the eu is a judeo-christian project yeah. pakistan would have a better yeah. <laughs> chance because <of, laughs> yeah. of the <laughs> i'd rather be a Pakistan than a turk yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the turk has yeah. been a the quintessential kind of uh other for for the the englishman yeah, yeah, yeah. History yeah. and that. Germany as well. Yeah. That discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, back when I was in school, that was that was really salient. But I think it's just this idea that you know the sort of that that sort of fanaticism mm. is inherent to Islam, and that that that's a very long-standing belief mm. that's very sort of indigenous here, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and so, as much as like all these databases are, I think, trying to you know objectify it and try to sort of like, okay, we're going to see more, more broadly. I think in a way, it take these, they, they end up taking a very ahistorical and sort of yeah. acontextual sort of approach to yeah. these things, you know what I mean? Salam guys, me again, reminding you to head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to keep the lights on on Islam21c. We pride ourselves on being independent and being funded by the grassroots community. Speaking of fanatics, uh, I think I'm a bit of a Quaker street coffee and bubble tea fanatic now. Uh, this Assam tea is very nice. I asked them to put, not put the bubbles in because it's kind of weird. Then but it's uh, not a bubble tea. It's just a tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bubble tea minus the bubbles. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> tea with that's, the that's like yeah. blasphemy <laughs> area for me, man. <laughs> All right. Back to the uh, pro prevent person. There okay. <laughs> so take out a yeah. poo paper clip. That actually sticks to his butt, huh? Yeah, yeah. it's a magnet. That's, man, you gave it's a lot a of uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gave a lot of good thought to this. Yeah. Right, I am. Um, <laughs> okay, according to Salman's dirty toilet paper, it is number eleven. Ah, uh, okay. So the uh, prevent. Uh, is not all that bad because 95% of prevent referrals don't lead to any action according to the Home Office's own statistics. So there. <laughs> um, so, yeah. It's, so this is referring to the prevent it, 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 what, uh, it, what, what, statistics. What that, what that statement does, and it's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's thrown out constantly. And um, what that statement does is 
completely ignore the experience of prevent and the, and by that by the experience of prevent it's the, ex, the experience of being surveilled the experience of being looked upon even the experience of a gp a psychiatrist a teacher being becoming an informant and what that does mm. to those professional relationships with 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 pupils with with patients whoever um and it, yeah it just completely ignores it and and it's it's ex, it's kind of an extraordinary thing to say because the it goes going hand in hand with that is what you're not speaking about and what you're you're purposefully silencing or ignoring is the chilling effects of prevent mm. and the chilling effects of prevent has been accepted by numerous professional organizations unions by what does the chilling effect so mean the chill, then, chilling effect is is whereby um children in in, in schools uh uh, patients in doctor surgeries. I say I don't want to. I just won't speak about. Don't want to talk about stuff yeah. openly. And I, and I'll, I'll I'll put a I'll give you specific examples of that. And this is this is one of the things that drag dragged me into shouting about prevent is that from being a being a teacher in a secondary school for um, so I was teaching in a secondary school for well in a couple of secondary schools for about twelve years, mm -hmm. and early on, so going back to the early two thousands, I would what? not you look like 20 years old <laughs> um, <laughs> mashallah it's the clark not, kent of it yeah <laughs> uh, not 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 regularly but yeah. i did have conversations with muslim kids who talked to me about wanting to travel to afghanistan and take part in in some some form some act of violence yeah. um and every single well, back time, then everyone was <laughs> yeah <laughs> but 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 it was but that's that's like it was a, cool then that's there's a, there's a <laughs> but there's there is a historical precedent to having those conversations yeah. whether you're a muslim or not look yeah. at the the civil war in 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 spain the spanish yeah. civil war where loads of leftists george orwell you know national hero yeah. went out to to fight against the fascists and and but anyway every one of those conversations i had with kids they would then realized that I was opposed to the war on terror, that we could write to our MPs, yeah. we could go on protests, and they became politically engaged without having to resort to an act of violence. And so so so, so that seemed to me that was so, a, that was a useful that, conversation to some have. Some would argue that's a bigger threat. <laughs> What's that? Engaging in <laughs> politics, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. But, th but that was a useful conversation to have. And, and, and that, to me, is how, in a democracy, violence is mediated, is, is prevented. Yeah. Um, and then, but then, as soon as I became, as a teacher, became an informant on those kind of conversations, then the, obviously those kids stop having those conversations. Mm. Um, and so it just seems to me that it's completely counterproductive. So I mean, I, it's, I completely stand by the idea that if you set out to design a strategy to increase political violence, you'd probably come up with prevent. Yeah. yeah. Um, and. Yeah, and just just to follow on from that, one of the one thing that I've spoken to Tarek about before is that there was a friend of mine who works in advertising, and he spent ten years running the for his ad agency running the government's anti-smoking campaign account, and he noticed over those ten years that civil servants were interested in their polling data of how effective the strategies were at stopping people from smoking, but. When they met, when he met with ministers, with elected ministers who were thinking about their short-term ele election cycle, mm. they were more interested in the polling of the whole population on the perception of their anti-smoking campaigns. So what they wanted to know was that did it look like they were being tough on bad people, the smokers? Yeah. And so it didn't matter. Back, you know, mm. 15 years ago when I used when I used to smoke, it didn't matter that every time I saw one of those anti-smoking adverts, I had a cigarette. It made me associate <laughs> and have a cigarette because that's not what they were for. Reminded you, they they weren't for stopping people from from smoking, yeah. and they never they never had that effect. Um, mm. And and prevent, you know, as we've talked about here, the you know, Muslims have become the the bogeyman. It's it's about being being tough on bad people, and so it feeds into, you know, it absolutely feeds into the rise of the right, and mm. and you know this. The, the the sort of the new right politics. Yeah, I mean my uh, my barrister Paul Bowen. Um, yeah, when we before we went into court for the judicial review again to prevent, he mm. said to me, and I was just kind of asking, what do you, what do you think this is all about? He said, governments don't make policy based on research and science. They make policies based on being seen to be doing something. Yeah. Mm. So I think that's the issue. I mean, we because we're. We're, we're talking about prevent now and it affects us 
we look at that but like you said smoking environment all kinds of stuff there's a huge delay between the lab bench mm-hmm. and, and knowledge production and actual policy and i think everyone anyone who's involved in anything critical anything kind of uh you know science or research oriented the all of those people get get annoyed at the yeah. government that government policy will hold, hold, hold a host of things yeah um you know about the the 95 percent statistic though mm-hmm. i was actually curious that um because they say 95 percent of prevent referrals in ki- for kids lead to no further action i was just wondering what percentage you'd get if you randomly and blindly <laughs> just yeah stop people in the street mm. what percentage of human beings are criminals or mm-hmm. or, 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 or dis- display display, display yeah. indicators based yeah. on some pseudo scientific logic yeah. that could be used to suggest that they might be future criminals yeah because yeah. i suspect it would be far less than 95 percent so yeah. the prevent kind of apparatus would have, but, but would the, have listen, the, the, the statistic itself yeah. is absolutely meaningless you can't compare it. There's no. There's no. There's no standard to compare it to, mm. right? What is What is a good? I think the control statistic. would be. They're, they're, they're are selling you more, it. Are you more successful at catching people on a pathway to some kind of crime if you just randomly mm. stop someone walking the street or but, coming out of the street? Yeah, yeah. yeah. but even, even even then, how 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 would you even quantify that? I mean, yeah, the whole absolutely. point is that the reason why they're selling that ninety five percent is because it's a good looking number. Yeah. yeah, you know, most people will just read it and be like, wow. 95% of people are innocent, you know, like this can't be a bad policy, you know, yeah. it's just showing that it's, it's, effect- showing it's, how effective, good everyone is. it's effective at proving mm. people's innocence. That's what they're trying to say. Mm. And there's such a large number of it, but it's an effectively meaningless yeah. number yeah. because we don't know anything about it. I mean, just to really harp on that point, you know, let's pretend it was somewhat, you know, proving that something was effective. It's not capturing the, f- the full effect, right? I mean, mm. I, 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 I often bring up the, the, the metaphor of a mayor poisoning a city, right? And, you know, he's doing it to catch all the rats. <laughs> I just made it. I should have mentioned the rats first because there's a mayor poisoning a city. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. It quickly. Just like, I should just stop at that, huh? The mayor poisoning a city and just move on to the next point. Mm. Um, so a mayor wants to stop, you know, he wants to catch rats and he's going to poison a city. And, you know, he catches the rats. Let's pretend he does. But yeah. people, a lot of people get sick. Right. So, you know, what prevent is setting out to achieve is not the only yeah. qualifying standard. Right. Mm. The whole the, the, the total dissolution or destruction of Muslim civil society can be considered a different factor yeah. of prevent. You know, and how are we mm. going to quantify that? There's an element of the fact that it has to be quantifiable. Ninety five percent. You know, I, I don't want to dig into the sort of intellectual history of mm. why that's the case. It has to be a number that people can that can, people can understand, but also that the government so you can, can put, make a bar chart. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> but, but exactly. I've, 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 it's, been, it's very I've been having this argument with, <laughs> with I've, I've had it with you with yeah. you before as well. Of since I think I first it first came up in 2013 was getting involved in conversations with people who were arguing for the Home Office to release the prevent statistics. That's been like an yeah. ongoing discussion, hasn't it? And then there was great celebration. Was it what 18 months ago when they first released the statistics? Mm. And I've actually always argued that we shouldn't be asking for statistics. We know what's wrong with prevent. We don't need to see any of these numbers. Yeah. And, and and all it does is it, it sits here, it, we, we sit here talking about the yeah. numbers. Um, I mean, thankfully, we haven't been dragged into talk, talk, talking about what, you know, trying to read the statistics, but there's so much energy spent. Well, there was so much energy trying to get the statistics out of the Home Office. So all of that activist energy went into that. Yeah. And then the statistics come out. So what? And then yeah. there's then there's there's dissection of the statistics. People have written books mm. about the statistics. It's we we know what's wrong. You I know, I, <laughs> I I think though there's something about the statistics that are important. Just to say that, um, well, wait a second. This is really really problematic. Ninety five percent are innocent, right? And we can just to say be honest, that, the five percent are probably innocent as well. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. That's <laughs> yeah. right. No, that's yeah. a very good point because yeah. they just went through some sort of intervention, yeah. and we yeah. know it could be like a mental health intervention. Mm. So it could be like some Muslim kid who's just angry, yeah. right? And they're like, "Oh, this kid has like antisocial behavior or whatever, mm. and he needs yeah, a mental one, health intervention." One, one thing I I heard as but, well from a mental health kind of practitioner is that well, we, our budget has been completely yes uh, yeah. starved. So there's that the there's an element of incentivizing. Yeah. So there's so many elements of this. And I mean, hmm. I, I've um, I've written about this because it's it's really quite significant, at least in terms of first of all understanding that these ninety five percent of the people, first of all, hmm. they're in a police database for seven years. Okay, 
that's not that's not a non-issue right the fact that it could be literally i mean how many over the years right now have been referred to prevent you know let's say mm -hmm. tens of thousands 95 percent of tens of thousands were just deemed like what why is this person in our why is this person been referred to the police mm -hmm. right they're immediately dismissed they're not they're not forwarded yeah. to channel or anything they're immediately dismissed so we have to start thinking well what are the qualities of such a person that they're going to get immediately dismissed. They're not going to get any form of intervention whatsoever. And there we can start drawing the logic of how do we know how people are actually referred to prevent in the first place. We know that people are referred to prevent because they put on a headscarf, you know, they grew a beard. And I've heard these cases personally. Mm. Hopefully right? not the same individual. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That'd, be, that'd be a different referral. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's where, um, that's where we need to consider, wait a second, are there tens of thousands of potentially Muslim women who are putting on the headscarf for the first time in a police database? You know, like that, that's a huge, that's a huge thought to have mm. because it's, you're, you're starting to consider that anyone who's any, in any way, shape or form remotely inspired a sense of suspicion in, in any public official, teacher, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. right? And then it was forwarded a safeguarding lead. That safeguarding lead is what stops a, a person from becoming a statistic. But yeah. if that safeguarding lead is like, yeah, I think growing a beard is, is problematic. I mean, one person was telling me about um, some a strange grid of numbers found in the, an inmate's cell. And he was going to refer him to something. Like I've heard much worse. I mean, <laughs> turned out to be a Ramadan calendar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've I've prayer, prayer you know, cal calendar. I, yeah, we we joke about this. Eighteen degrees. But these <laughs> these <laughs> these things are not. Yeah. Um, you know, these things are really really yeah. problematic. Can you explain what you meant by incentivize for the audience? So. Sure. So we know in austerity, a lot of services are being cut. Um. But lo and behold, there's so much money in counter-terrorism, <laughs> counter yeah. counter-extremism, counter-radicalization. Um, so Charlotte Heath Kelly has written about this. Um, but it's quite logical. The fact that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, if you want to put someone on a regular, let's say, mental health service waiting list, mm -hmm. we know that that person can take months. But we know that somehow if you put them, if you flag radicalization, well, hey, we know, I, I, have, I have a patient, I feel like he really needs to see a mental health professional yeah. right now. He might blow himself up. He might blow himself up. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, he might just not be a really good worker. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And whatever, you know, he needs, he, needs, he needs the money, he needs whatever. He just needs help immediately. Yeah. Let, me, let me flag radicalization. Because now this is the issue with, this, with the fact that prevent will incentivize yeah. that people will get mental health services if it's there it's going to be and used i've got yeah. a specific example that i was giving a talk at the was in a debate at the law society in 2014 and i think that that date's relevant because it's that this means it's been going on for at least five years and probably long before that and there was a social worker in the audience who stood up and, and said she, she said that he, she has repeatedly made prevent referrals for people that she is trying to give support as in her capacity as a social worker and who she recognizes are in desperate need of housing mm. and she knows that the only way that she's going to get them at the top to the top of the list and into 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 in some some form of secure housing yeah. is to make a prevent referral so that then this is back to those feedback loops that i was talking about mm. with offset in schools and everything so at least for five years We've got the Home Office, forget the prevent statistics that we get given, the Home Office are looking at all of these referrals and saying, and they, and they can look around the country and say, look, there are that many in Birmingham, that many in, in central London or whatever. And that, that tells you, if you're a civil servant, that we need prevent. Yeah. Mm. Because these trusted professionals or social workers are making yeah. those referrals. Um, and it's just yeah, and it's that's happening in ev every in every facet of. I, I think society. I just want to say yeah. this is why it's so important. Whenever I speak about prevent publicly, um, I'm talking about a countering violent extremism industry, and I always emphasize yeah. industry because I don't think we do so enough. Mm -hmm. You know, the moment the sort of like statistics come out is this idea of supply and demand, right? Oh, there's mm -hmm. so many referrals, so something is happening. Therefore, there's more mm. demand for it, you know, and there's more of a case that the prevent, you know, yeah. you know, the government can make 
to, to you know, take more of its budget because they're saying, well, look how many referral statistics we have. Mm. Um, and this is really quite significant also in the global sale of countering violence yeah. extremism. Yeah. I mean, we know that security exports is one of the largest growing exports of the UK, right? Yeah. And, you know, counter radicalization, countering extremism is actually one really big facet of that. So the more they can collect any form of statistics, the more they can actually make a sale. <clears throat> And I think there's something here that's really, really yeah. significant. And it's also that on that export of it's 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 no coincidence that prevent like strategies were so rapidly taken up by kind of particularly autocratic, despotic, you know, mm. <laughs> um, states yeah. because that's you know it is it is it only fits into an authoritarian logic. Yeah. I mean, even here, if it's there, it's going to be used. Even divorce lawyers. I hear are, are are using in divorce proceedings um, to get custody of kids. A lot, a lot of people yeah. are kind of arguing their spouses and extremists or on the pathway to ra radicalization as well. Yeah. So but, if but, it's, if I, it's I think, but I think this is language, where this is where this is all. Yeah. It, it's. It, people, I think I think a lot a lot of people, a lot of white people, think that this is a very niche Muslim issue that mm -hmm. we're talking about. And actually, to use to use your case as an example, I was talking to a defamation lawyer the other day who works with celebrity clients. And he he was getting quite excited about your case because around defamation mm -hmm. and it's yeah. because it feeds back into yeah. know, the, the law that's being used by celebrities around defamation as well. So it's all of this is is connected. It's much far. It's it's and this is what you you were talking about mm -hmm. at the beginning. Is this is indicative of a malaise across the whole of society rather yeah. than just this a sort of niche Muslim issue. Yeah, yeah. excellent. So I'm not saying you're a <laughs> yeah, I was, I was me out here. You got excited for you. Uh. I got really uh, kind of tough, <laughs> getting hyped up now. You know, yeah, let's uh, let's organize a meeting. Yeah. You know, me and uh, me and all the other fellow celebs. Okay, let's do one more round of this quickly. Go ahead. Get to prevent duty. I'm still impressed by the the, yeah. the tissue paper. I mean, it's this it must have been detail. that's what we like. It must have been much more easy. difficult for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it required a lot. I was actually thinking of trying to write the whole question out, but then I thought um, <laughs> that's too much headache. I can just add that in post. Did you do it on the toilet? <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, number eight. Uh, okay. This is probably relevant to you. Prevent is about safeguarding now. It's not about stopping necessarily someone blowing themselves up, but it's about it's 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 described as about safeguarding kids from mm. grooming from all kinds of you know uh, so, harm. So yeah, it's good. Right? <laughs> safeguarding so, is good. So, Why so do you pre hate prevent kids? prevent is 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 a, is a prime example of bureaucratization and bureaucratization rem distancing us from a problem. And what I mean by that, very specifically in in schools, when I first started teaching, there was so there, there are certain CPD, continual professional development, that mm -hmm. all teachers have to do. Same with doctors, same with lawyers, same with all professions. And as teachers, you have to do a certain amount of CPD every year. The, the first point of CPD used to be, in every single school, used to be, at the beginning of every year, you'd get um, it's in the in the inset day, which is that the first or normally the first yeah. day of of, of, of September, where community. where parents get really frustrated because they, <laughs> they haven't worked out they haven't worked out childcare into that one day, and they suddenly realise that school hasn't really started that day. Yeah. And as you, well, that's when teachers are sitting in, in their CPD. And the first thing that was always t that was always told to you was that you'd get someone would stand up at the front and they'd say, "I'm the child protection lead. If you have any suspicions about any child." You come to me. You need to talk to me. I'm the single point of contact. That's it. So, th so there wasn't. That was the extent of the bureaucracy. There were mm. no forms or anything. You just had to talk to that person. And that is a. It's it, in it, in its simplicity and in its lack of bureaucracy. That was a. That was a very good system. You're so still you go getting up to them and like think. I think little Jimmy's a bit of an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> go um, but you know. But and 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 you do get. Is that coming from experience? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like that was hyper. Damn Jimmy. Um, <laughs> but 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 then then so now, now when it comes to safeguarding, first of all you've got to do your prevent training, which okay. is taking over the other professional development that you might have. It's it's, it's taking up hours of of the teacher's training time. But it also creates these these questions about because 
no one can sit through prevent training. So either you sit through prevent training and you are a dyed in the wool racist and you and you nod your head and think great yeah and then you report the first kid who asks who who talks to you about about going to prayer at lunchtime yeah. um or you you think oh this is this is a bit dodgy what am i meant to do and and there's been this whole bureaucracy so now to to to, to triage it, lots of schools have done to triage prevent and safeguarding issues They'll have the same form, but it's a different color. So you fill in one form and that's the way they try and sort of say it's still safeguarding. But whatever way it's cut, you've ended up creating this bureaucracy, which now has forms to fill in to give to the different person. There's a different person who's the prevent lead, the different person who's a safeguarding lead. And and it's just simply not safeguarding. And from the example that I gave you before about having conversations with kids around mm. political agendas, it's it's not making any anyone less less safe less safe it's not it's not even making anyone more safe um besides which any referrals any genuine concerns they happen without prevent anyway and and go, going out outside of schools now the prime example of that is the manchester bomber salman abadi who is my mm -hmm. understanding that he's referred five times by his mosque to the counter-terrorism police referrals that that they've said they would have made without prevent in place anyway because they were genuinely concerned about this guy and what he, what he was going to do quite rightly mm. but and we now know from the prevent statistics that the counter-terrorism police had a spreadsheet with seven thousand referrals on it that year and they didn't they're, they're under resourced because of austerity and they didn't get to them yeah. they didn't get to those five referrals so that is a, a prime example that prevent the existence of prevent has prevented the, t the police from doing their work yeah. Which you know, there stopping is, an actual crime, so, and stopping an actual yeah. cri actual crime because of prevent, because of those mm. those referrals that have been solicited by pre prevent and referrals that yeah. would have happened anyway. Salam guys. Last reminder, I promise. Head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to help this movement get to the next level. So we have genuine, high quality media articulating Islam in the 21st century and developing confident Muslims impacting the world for the better. Yes, of course. There stopping is, an actual crime. So, and stopping an actual yeah. cri actual crime because of prevent, because of those mm. those referrals that have been solicited by pre prevent and referrals that yeah. would have happened anyway. I mean, one of the quotes is, "Oh, you always c complaining about prevent. Um, what's the alternative? What do you suggest? You know, mm. to keep us safe from terrorism." And yeah. one of the things is stop doing prevent. Yeah, exactly. Stop doing prevent. <laughs> because it's counter it's actively counterproductive. I think that's something we need to keep mm. repeating because you know, the racist in the street, he's not going to agree with all that intellectual stuff about, you know, um structural racism and 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 Islamophobia and all that kind of stuff. But what he is going to agree with is if it's actually making me less safe then Yeah. You know, but also yeah. also going going back to the the racist in the street, the not to make it, make offend it. any street enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> no, not to offend but, all the racists on the street. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 this 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 all that that idea of the chilling effect as well yeah. is having having taught in London schools, you also come across white racist kids, and and I want to have the conversation with them. I want them in the classroom in a safe environment to say something mm. that is that we can then thrash out and we can get we can kind of mm. we can unpick and diffuse that Beat that tension. Later. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, with your words. I mean, there's no doubt that, like, you know, any any government, you know, structure management of subject like political subjectivity in any way, shape, or form, political experience, any management of that is always going to backfire. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no doubt about that, you know. Um, and in a way, that's exactly what Prevent is doing. I mean, the idea of safeguarding itself was also just ridiculous. It, it was something that just came up to them later, and they're like, "Ah, okay, mm -hmm. it seems like this was, should have been safeguarding all along." Yeah. You it know, because it's gone in in phases. It's gone yeah. in phases, and it's one of those Preventing ridiculous. violent extremism, then exactly. non-violence, then British values, Some British <laughs> yeah. values yeah. fundamental values. Well, yeah. I mean, all these things are always, and they're always yeah. coexisting as well. And the, and the last right. the last iteration of that is worth pointing out. It was safeguarding, and then yeah. and you can see it in kind of waves on Twitter of all the CVE workers. Yeah. And the last the last one, which is I think has been quite effective, is is going after white racists, going after yeah. the far right, and then and then saying, "So look, we're not racist." Yeah, and that that was definitely. I mean, that, that was there was a move there. To, that that would have been a good. Out. I think that would have been a much better question yeah. than uh, poop number eight. Um, <laughs> that is one I, of the I questions, think, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, we can get to that if I you like. Uh, I mean, I can maybe just address yeah. that, but you know, I just want to mention that 
it's really important to emphasize that, you know, there were very good safeguarding measures regardless. Mm -hmm. I mean, myself as a mental health professional, you know, someone who's about to commit an act of violence to themselves or others has always been known, you know, just intuitively, we know to contact the police. Mm. But specifically in mental health, I mean, <laughs> someone has written... Something about bubble tea. You said ditch, right? Um, <laughs> That's where snitches end up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think the, the this very notion of like, just sort of, you know, it, breaking that that trust it is a snitch ultimately yeah. no <laughs> it is i I'm mean kidding, i'm kidding it, right, it, it hurt right. it hurt a little bit but i'll hide my feelings <laughs> just for now you know i think there's something to be said about how ultimately you know it's just adding a certain yeah. layer of something that didn't mm. need to be added yeah right and that's why you notice and prevent it's very moralizing and by moralizing i mean there's a strong sense of good and evil in the prevent training mm. and an example i give from my from my research you know there was a, a psychologist in a in a prevent training you know and the prevent trainer is like we got to do this we got to do that and she's like wait a second why are why are we doing this and <laughs> because it's the right thing to do <laughs> precisely someone turned someone turned to her and said you know very very sharply said we're just trying to save lives <laughs> And you, you sense how moralizing, it's so palpable, yeah. right? That's how it's being sold. Because intuitively, you're, you're, you're not adding anything substantial. Yeah. You're creating a whole different managerial structure, mm. which belongs to a wider sort of corporate system of like, we need to sell a threat. And, you know, yeah. it belongs into the mm. larger military industrial complex, which we don't have to get into. But just on, on, <clears throat> on like the point of safeguarding, most people in healthcare, at least, are like this sits really awkwardly in safeguarding and that's what charlotte heath kelly found out in yeah. her in her survey right mm -hmm. of like nhs professionals they're like actually prevent is not really doing or adding anything besides this added layer which doesn't really make any sense right yeah. i'm not saying even if like they all agreed it would still be okay it's not about like public yeah. opinion but I'm just saying, you know, people are still willing to admit that there's something really awkward about how it sits in safeguarding mm -hmm. because this whole idea of pre-criminality -cr pre is absolutely racist, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it wasn't something that people weren't doing already. Um, and so I think there's, there's a lot of problems right now, especially when we talk about alternatives, you know, well, if it's not going to be safeguarding, what is it? You know, we can get into that. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just really important to emphasize that, you know, and it's also important to mention, you know, in Germany, there is like this uh, mental health service. I forgot what it's called. I think it's something called like the dark zone. <laughs> yeah. You can leave it to Germany Freudian to be so, <laughs> so depressing. Um, but it's actually a mental health service is a mental health service for people who feel like potentially they're, um, you know, they have sort of pedophilic tendencies or something. Oh, okay. Okay. Not so, nothing to do with skin color or anything. Yeah, no, <laughs> almost. Um, and um, the whole point of that mental health service is that it it promises people that you can come get you can come get support, mm. and it's absolutely going to, like absolutely confidential and anonymous. Like we're going to protect mm. your information. Mm. The government will never know about you, so to speak, right? And you can you can see how that element of of sanctuary of safe space is so significant. Yeah. You know, right now with the erosion of Muslim civil society, you know, I I've dealt with a lot of kids who have these type of interests or whatever. Right? They have this sort of like okay, you know, whatever, you know, these political ambitions. Um, and that does not say that they're going to be violent, but you know, they admitted to me. I got nobody to go to anymore. Mm. You know, I got nobody to speak with about this. And, and this is and just that, a function of being a teenager, uh, yeah. whether you're Muslim or not. You know, that's mm. exactly this. You know, having having radical ideas and talking them through. Absolutely. You know, that's that's. What you you I mean, it just it just brings it back to the idea that they're obviously pathologizing every element of adolescence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think that's the idea of also destroying this 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 I think this valuable concept of safeguarding. Okay. Right. Mm. And that's actually what they've effectively destroyed is that in fact then there's no more safe space because mm -hmm. safeguarding has become more a question of political management yeah. than it is actually about there's there's a significant acute issue that needs to be addressed here that you know I can I can lay it out. 
you know, black on white. This person's about to hurt himself. Yeah. He's about to hurt someone else. Otherwise, it could be dealt with in a hundred million ways that doesn't involve the police or the government. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, we've uh, we've run out of time, which is, I think, a good sign normally. Um, sometimes when it's boring, I'm kind of looking at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm glad that didn't happen. So I just wanted you to round up maybe 10 seconds. You know, what's the future of Prevent Each? Who wants to go first? The future of Prevent? <laughs> yeah. In or 10 seconds. The future of CVE. The whole industry. Uh, I mean, the future of CVE is going to be global. Period. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a really big, massive industry, and we can expand it. We can expect it to to grow, expand, and evolve uh, very, very quickly. As long as, especially Google and Facebook and all these other corporations are becoming involved. Yeah, I I think that's. Come on, chair. That's, that's, I, no, I think I think I think Tarek's right to that. That's the direction of travel, but I also think. Like it, 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 our our lives are contingent on. For me, our lives are contingent on us demanding and expecting mm. something more utopian. And I think that, and I think particularly with Prevent, when when I started uh, started speaking out against Prevent, started writing news articles, appearing in in people's YouTube videos and stuff against Prevent, and kids mm. that I taught going back a few years saw those. They started that chilling effect was was. Was reversed. was was reversed, and they they felt that they had the confidence to talk about yeah. it. So I think the more that we talk about prevent and talk about how ridiculous it is, the better we do at undermining it. Yeah. So I think we I think we can have we can have an impact on it. We can undermine it, and we you know and just talking about it like this does does that. Mm. So so you're you're right, Tarek, and it, it is it is mm-hmm. it is expanding with through surveillance capitalism, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But we we can we can undermine it. We can keep we you know we can we can keep having these conversations and we can make it better. Inshallah, inshallah. inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for uh, watching at home as well. Yeah, I've been your host, Salman Bhatt. This has been Dr. Tarek Yunus and Dr. Rob Four Walker. Uh, we'll put their names and details in description below and stuff and on screen. Maybe you can hit them up on social media and subscribe to Prevent Digest as well, if you don't mind. Do that. Uh, you might get two or three more <laughs> subscriptions <laughs> from this. Uh, if you watched and made it to the end of this video, this podcast, congratulations again. You're awesome. I did read uh, the names of the people who wrote their names in the comments below who reached the end of the last podcast. Shall I read them out? Should we read, okay, give them, should we, should we read them out? Let's put their names on. <laughs> two people. Is it just different iterations of Sir Men? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I will maybe put their names in the description or on the screen just to give you guys a boost. So if you did reach the end of this podcast, uh, congratulations for being awesome. Uh, just a reminder again to subscribe, hit the bell notification so you get uh, notified for future podcasts and videos and stuff. And subscribe to us wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, other than that, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, script.